the profession still won't embrace it. And certainly not the dietetics profession because they built everything on the low fat diets and the whole story about high fat diets causing everything, heart disease and everything else. And they're completely wrong. There is no evidence for that. But they can't admit that because that's what they taught and that's all they understand. The public is slowly changing the doctors because the public is going to the doctors and saying, listen, you know, I went on Dr. Noakes's diet. I lost 20 kilograms or 40 pounds, blood pressure control, diabetes in remission, and what you were doing for me doesn't work. to the Wise Traditions Podcast, sponsored by the Weston A. Price Foundation for Wise Traditions and Food Farming in the Healing Arts. We are your source for scientific knowledge and traditional wisdom to help you achieve optimal health. I'm your host, Hilda Labrata-Gore. This is episode 121, and my guest is Professor Tim Noakes. He is a brilliant scientist and a defender of real food. He is the co-author of Real Meal Revolution, Changing the World One Meal at a Time. And he is rated as an A1 scientist by the National Research Foundation of South Africa. Professor Noakes started researching the effects of carbohydrates, proteins, and fats on the human race. And he became convinced that a high-fat, low-carb diet is the healthiest option for many. A few years ago, he was embroiled in a controversy when he replied to a young mother on Twitter about weaning her baby to a high-fat, low-carb diet. Today, we'll discuss the hearing that ensued, the verdict, and its consequences. You'll also hear eye-opening information related to the Banting diet, Tim's perspective on carb intake, fat adaptation, and how you need never really diet or feel deprived again. Before we get into it, we want to let you know about a special deal this month. It is the Weston A. Price Foundation's version of March Madness. It's March Membership Madness. What does this mean? You can become a member of the foundation supporting its important work, including this podcast, for only $30. That's a $10 savings over regular membership. So join today by going to westonaprice.org and click on the button that says Member Yet. The Weston A. Price Foundation is helping you and the world eat better. And now we take a moment to thank our sponsors. This episode of the Wise Traditions podcast is brought to you by Sauna Space. Sauna Space is the sauna for every body. Sauna Space is the maker of incandescent-based, full-spectrum, EMF-shielded, portable sauna solutions, handcrafted with love in the USA. Go to saunaspace.com and use the coupon code WISETRADITIONS, that's all caps, one word, for 10% off at checkout. Sauna Space, the sauna for everybody at saunaspace.com. And Kraut Pounder, do you make your own ferments? You're going to want this beautiful tool by Kraut Pounder. It does just what its name suggests. It is a handmade piece of maple that is unique and perfectly crafted for preparing your ferments. So get yourself a Kraut Pounder today from krautpounder.com. Welcome to Wise Traditions, Tim. Thank you, Hilda. I was so eager to get you on this show because... Many of us caught wind of that tweet that got you into trouble some years ago. Let's clue our listeners in. Just let us all know what exactly happened. Well, I was targeted by the Association of Dietitians for South Africa because we wrote a book called Real Meal Revolution, and it completely changed the opinion of many people in South Africa towards diet, and it promoted a high-fat, low-carbohydrate diet, which is the exact opposite of the dietary guidelines. And the problem was that many people in South Africa, their health improved dramatically. And when they went to ask dietitians, is this a safe diet? They were told, no, it's highly dangerous and it'll cause you to have a heart attack and all sorts of other things. But then they said, well, where's the evidence? And no one could come up with any evidence. So we have clear evidence that there was an action to get me. And so on one particular day in February 2014, I was asked what we call a we question. In other words, the mother asked babies and mommies, which is a we question, which means that I was giving information, not advice. And I finished off the tweet by saying, key is to wean onto LCHF diet. And the lady knew what LCHF meant because she had read our book, The Real Meal Revolution. Mm -hmm. So we were saying wean onto real foods, which is animal produce, And uh, essentially why that was a problem, because I didn't mention cereals and grains. And of course, the whole industry of weaning is that you should wean the child onto pureed cereals. Right. And so the industry didn't want me saying those things. I was then charged 
for unprofessional conduct in dangerous advice that could be harmful. So that was the charge. And it's been four years later. We've had 25 days in court. We've had an original decision. I won 10-0. In other words, there were 10 decisions. I won all of them. I gave nine days of evidence, including three and a half days of cross-examination under oath. It's never happened before that a modern scientist has been charged for giving an opinion <laughs> on nutrition. <laughs> And we had Nina Teicholt as one expert witness. We had Zoe Harcom from Wales. She came out and Karen Zinn came from New Zealand and they gave another three days testimony. So we gave 12 days of testimony and our goal was to prove that the advice is not unconventional and it's not dangerous, which we, of course, is not difficult to prove because that is the facts. So if I hear you correctly, Tim, you believe that this group, the group of dietitians, you were in their crosshairs because you were giving advice that was very contrary to what they were giving and it was threatening their position as experts. Is that right? That's absolutely correct. And in fact, what really happened was there was a young man who wrote an article on our News 24 channel and it was called Tim Noakes and BS, but he used the complete BS word, <laughs> which I'll, I'll, I'll spare us from. <laughs> and he said, you know, Noakes changed his mind about diet and obviously he's wrong. I thought he was wrong and I watched and read about it and everyone was taking him off and taking him out and criticizing him. So I thought, well, this is quite a story when they've got this famous scientist suddenly gets it all wrong. And then he read it and he said, well, actually he didn't get it wrong. It's the dietitians who got it wrong. Oh. So he wrote this article, which was downloaded 120,000 times. And there were about 200 comments to it. And most of them were not complimentary to the dietitians. And it was because of that article that the head of the Dietetics Association in South Africa approached the Health Professional Council of South Africa, to which I'm a member because I'm a registered medical doctor. And they said, we've got a problem with Noakes. We have to do something about it. And they called it the Tim Noakes problem. And it was nothing to do with me. I was not criticizing the dietitians. It was these other people. Uh -huh. And we have absolute evidence that there was a conspiracy to shut me up and to silence me, essentially. Well, interestingly, this whole uproar over the tweet and this time in front of this group really actually served only the opposite, didn't it? It didn't silence <laughs> you. As a matter of fact, it gave you a broader platform. Yes, indeed. You're quite right. And the end result was that we wrote a book called Law of Nutrition, Challenging Conventional Dietary Beliefs. And that is a story of the last seven years of my life. The last seven years in when I changed my own diet, started eating a high fat diet, and the last five years in which this trial has been ongoing. It gives the whole story in everything that happened. See, what people didn't understand was that when something is in black and white, it's there forever. And I collected all the criticisms about me in the media and the press and the scientific journals, and I put it all in there. And then we have in the middle of the book is the trial, and Marikas Boros, who's my co-author, in 100 pages, she describes the trial, all the evidence, the cross-examinations and so on. And then I finish up with more of the hard science. It's a magnificent book because it reads like a thriller. The scientist getting taken out for being wrong and then him fighting back and saying, well, actually, you guys are wrong. The people who attacked me are wrong. And then we win the case. And so it's been an interesting journey, that's for sure. Absolutely. I wonder if something like that could happen here across the pond over here in the <laughs> U.S. because it might serve to really bring things to a head and point out how wrongheaded some of the science and where the government is steering us. You know, a lot of people say, but where's freedom of speech in South Africa? That it shows there is potentially no freedom of speech. And it's interesting that there are two cases in the world like this. There's one in Australia and one here. And I had a German with me yesterday, and he said, you know, this case could never have happened in Germany. They would never have been able to do this to you. For some reason that the South African Health Professional Council has too much authority over doctors and that they were able to do this. I don't think it would have happened in America because of laws of freedom of speech and so on. I think that it doubted would have happened. And so what has happened with the population as a whole? I see that you put out this book. That's been a win. But are people taking to this low-carb, high-fat diet? Or is there still a lot of controversy surrounding us? What's happening in South Africa? Well, that's really interesting. There's a lot of controversy in the profession. The profession still won't embrace it. And certainly not the dietetics profession because they built everything on the low-fat diets and the whole story about high fat diets causing everything, heart disease and everything else. And they're completely wrong. There is no evidence for that, but they can't admit that because that's what they're taught and that's all they understand. 
the public is slowly changing the doctors because the public is going to the doctors and saying, listen, you know, I went on Dr. Noakes' diet. I lost 20 kilograms or 40 pounds, blood pressure control, diabetes in remission, and what you were doing for me doesn't work. The best measure of our success is a Facebook page in Cape Town called the Banting 7-Day Meal Plan Facebook page. It started three years ago, and many Americans, of course, won't know what the name Banting means. Well, we introduced Banting as a name for a diet that was developed by William Banting in Britain in 1862. That's a fascinating story. I can't wait for our listeners to hear about it, that this undertaker, right, he was having trouble with his weight in the 1800s. So tell us exactly what happened. So he went to his doctor, William Harvey, and he actually was complaining that he was not only overweight, but he couldn't hear anymore. And Harvey had just come back from Paris and had heard Claude Bernard, the very famous French physiologist, speaking. And Claude Bernard had just worked out that the liver produced glucose. And clearly he'd been talking about glucose and diabetes and maybe carbohydrates in the diet. And Harvey picked up the message that carbohydrates make you fat, which was the popular idea then. So he came back and was dealing with Banting and said to Banting, listen, you're eating too much carbohydrate. You've got to cut the carbohydrate. And did that, and Banting had a great success. Everything else had failed. All the other diets that he tried had failed. Mm. So he was then wrote a book about it and was very excited. And the book was a global bestseller. He went to the Lancet, the medical journal, the Lancet, and said, you know, you must reproduce what's happened to me. And they said, no, you're not a doctor, so we don't listen to you. So anyway, when we wrote The Real Meal Revolution, we called the diet the Banting diet, not the low-carbohydrate diet. We called it the Banting diet. Mm -hmm. And to get to my point was that today there are in excess of 1.1 million members of that Facebook page. And that covers most of South Africa. But the interesting thing is 80% of the people are Kosa or Zulu-speaking black South Africans, which is remarkable because it means that this diet, which was described by myself and other middle-class whites, has gone right across all the racial divides in this country. And it's become the most popular amongst the black South Africans. And that makes us really proud. I think the real reason why they adopted it so well is, A, it works, and B, black South Africans tend to be more insulin resistant than white South Africans, so they're going to benefit more. But they've not been under this sort of diet illusion that we've all been under about heart disease and eating the wrong foods and so on. So when something comes along and works, they adopt it and say, gosh, it works for me. I'm feeling healthy. This is the way to go. Absolutely. Kind of the proof is in the pudding. The proof is in the high fat pudding, I would say. Um, (laughs) But also, this is really in keeping, Tim, with the way the wise traditions principles work. Like it's about real food and high fat. Some people think the wise traditions diet is all about high fat. No, it's actually about eating naturally, which tends to be higher fat and higher protein than carb. But also this diet that you're describing sounds very much like the Atkins diet to me. What are the similarities there? The key was that Atkins said cut carbohydrates and to lower that less than 60 grams per day. That was the key of his diet because he wanted you to be in ketosis. And our diet, it's almost the same. Any diet that cuts carbohydrates is going to be very, very similar. There might be minor nuances. Maybe we suggest you should eat a little more vegetables than Atkins did. But we still follow his entire process and his rules. They're incorporated. As far as we're concerned is you count the grams of carbohydrate. And you try to get it down to below 50 grams per day if you are diabetic or pre-diabetic. If you're just healthy, 100, 150 grams is probably fine. But the key is, which we're beginning to realize, is that if you're insulin resistant, the lower the carbohydrate intake, the better, the longer you're going to live without developing type 2 diabetes. Now, I just interviewed a doctor recently who was saying carb intake is important for immediate energy. What would you say to that? Oh, that's nonsense. (laughs) It's absolute nonsense. And I'm an exercise physiologist at heart. I'm a medical doctor who did most of his research on carbohydrates during exercise and wrote the book Law of Running, which extols the virtues of carbohydrates. And the answer is, if you want to exercise at a very high intensity and you only have ever eaten carbohydrates, he's quite correct. Carbohydrates become the fuel. But he's only talking about people who are carbohydrate adapted. If you're fat adapted, in other words, you've been eating this high fat diet for a long time, probably more than six weeks, maybe a bit longer than that. 
you burn fat and you burn fat at even at high intensity. So for the vast majority of athletes, I'm talking now about the vast majority, not the people competing in the Olympics or at very high level over short duration exercise of say up to two hours. For the vast majority of people that you see on the road, they should be burning fat because that's what their body wants to burn. And that will give them all the energy they need. So the idea that you need carbohydrates for energy is just nonsensical. It's just wrong. As a matter of fact, I think you went so far in your book to say that you kind of called it a carbageddon, right? (laughs) That the human (laughs) dietary disaster is came along with the invention of human agriculture. That's when we really started getting sick and we lost height and our teeth fell out and we got osteoporosis and a whole bunch of other things, including maybe arterial disease. But it's clear, and in my book, Law of Nutrition, we have the second last chapter is once we were healthy. And if you go back to before the agricultural revolution, we were extremely healthy and the populations were profoundly healthy. And so if you go back in your country, you look at the Plains Indians, they were probably the healthiest people on the planet. And they were living just on bison, but they didn't just eat the meat of the bison, they ate the bison from nose to tail. And they knew nutrition like we haven't even begun to understand it. And that is why they were so healthy. And the early Americans who went west of the Mississippi and met the Plains Indians just said, my gosh, we've never met such healthy people. Coming up, Tim goes into specifics about what you can expect as you change your diet. And he tells us in detail what he ate when he just got started and the changes he noticed as a result. We pause now to remind you that it is March Membership Madness. When you become a member of the Weston A. Price Foundation, you become a part of a community of like-minded people with an extensive, comprehensive website, easy access to pasture-raised food, and you support the raw milk movement, this weekly podcast, and so much more. So join today for only $30. Go to westonaprice.org and click on the button that says Member Yet. The Weston A. Price Foundation is helping you and the world eat better. And we pause now to recognize our sponsors of today's episode. Sauna Space, the sauna for everybody. Sauna Space crafts modern product solutions that bring ancestral light therapy and heat therapy to all with accessible and flexible design. Experience the rejuvenating power of ancestral healing and the convenience of your own home with Sauna Space. They harness the unique combination of natural near-infrared light and heat therapy, delivering full body healing and detoxification. I have just started using my own single panel light every night and I can already feel its effects. It improves my sleep and I know it's allowing for deep cellular regeneration. All Sauna Space products exhibit beautiful craftsmanship and are backed by a lifetime warranty. So go to saunaspace.com and use the coupon code WISE TRADITIONS, all caps, one word, for 10% off at checkout. You can also just visit their website for more on the healing science of incandescence. That's saunaspace.com. And Kraut Pounder. Have you tried making your own ferments? You must get yourself a Kraut Pounder. Kraut Pounder makes beautiful pieces for the process. Each Kraut Pounder is turned from a solid piece of maple natural hard wood. They each have their own unique markings and are finished with natural walnut oil. The design for the pounder was inspired by a Kraut Pounder that belonged to a grandmother of a member in the Eugene, Oregon Weston A. Price chapter. Go to krautpounder.com today and get fermenting. What are the dangers of going in this direction, maybe too quickly? Are there any drawbacks? Oh, yes. I think in the first week, a lot of people feel sick and ill, and particularly that's because they're mostly sugar addicted. So if you cut out sugar, it's like if you stop smoking or you remove alcohol from your diet, if you've got a propensity to drink alcohol, or you stop smoking, you feel terrible for a period. And that's probably the only thing. Once you get over that first week or two, and start to adapt. It's amazing. I was fortunate that I was almost certainly diabetic when I started the diet. I had only made the diagnosis after I'd been on the diet for some months because I didn't test myself. (laughs) I was so stupid. (laughs) (laughs) But I benefited from the day one. I just felt better because here I was treating my diabetes with the treatment, which is a low carbohydrate diet. So I didn't have anything of that. I just felt amazing (laughs) within days. And And that experiment you kind of ran on yourself was in 2010, right? What changes did you make right away, Tim? Like, talk to us about specifically some of the changes you made to your diet. Well, I went for a run on December the 12th, uh, 2010, and I came home 
And by chance, I went out and bought the book, The New Atkins for the New You. And they saved my life because I read the book and then I said, oh my gosh, I got it all wrong. The advice I'd been giving was completely wrong. And within two hours, I was so convinced that I said, that's my last carb. And I cut the bread and the potatoes and the rice and the cereals and the grains and the sugary drinks, cut them immediately and just went on to a high carnivorous diet. And I just said, listen, I've always loved eating meat. I'll just eat meat for a few months because I figured that if I was going to get a nutritional deficiency, it wasn't going to happen in months. It would happen in six months or eight months. So I said, I don't care about being nutritionally balanced. I'm just going to eat non-carbohydrate foods. And I did that and I lost incredible amounts of weight and I just felt so amazing. And within six weeks, my running went back like 20 years to what I was doing when I was a 40 year old. And I couldn't believe it. It was utterly astonishing because I've always been running and I've loved running. And for 20 years, I've just been slowing down. And then suddenly to go back 20 years in six weeks was just astonishing. So that convinced me that I was onto something really important. And what was your next step? What did you do after that? Nothing. I was terrified because I knew that people would be very angry with me for changing from being high carbohydrate to being high fat. But unfortunately, after about a year, the South African public learned about it. And so one or two people came to talk to me on radio and television, and particularly one a very good friend of mine. He did a television interview on one of the more important current affairs sort of stories. And it was very funny because he got me to have lunch with him, you see, but he gave us a huge piece of steak with this massive roll of fat on it. And so he said, so Tim, see all this fat on this piece of steak. Are you going to eat the fat? I said, yes, I'm eat the fat and I'm throwing the meat away. <laughs> it's just to, just to make the point. And that then stirred the heart foundation and everyone went ballistic thereafter. <laughs> And within about six months, the cardiologist at my own university started writing stories about me to the media and that, that I'd lost it completely and that I was telling people to eat fat that would kill them. And I was telling them to stop using their cholesterol-lowering statin drugs. And this was tantamount to murder. And that then became the general theme for the next five years or so, that I was attacked by every official organization Every official dietary organization in South Africa attacked me. And that's what I wrote in the book. The beauty of the book is that I say, well, this is what they said. This is the evidence they gave, which is usually nothing. It's just their opinion. They mm -hmm. never give evidence. And then I said, well, here's that scientific evidence with references. And so I just fought all those arguments. And, and when you read all the evidence, you say, but actually, they didn't have any evidence. And I think that that's what's exciting about the book is that doctors are reading it and saying, oh, my gosh. We didn't realize we'd been conned so effectively for the last 50 years or so. And you were attacked not just because you were threatening their position as experts and upsetting the status quo, but because those statins are a big income stream for <laughs> a lot of folks, right? Like they're pushing them in the U.S. They're pushing them even on young children, I understand. Yeah, and, and I've labeled them as probably the most ineffective drugs ever developed in medicine. Because the benefits are so trivial that if you're a healthy person and you take a statin, it's now estimated you have to treat approximately 5,000 people for one person to benefit. That's people below the age of 60. 5,000 people for one to benefit? If you've got heart disease, it's between, say, 50 and 150 people that you have to treat for one to benefit. I speak to audiences and I ask them, if I gave you a drug that helped only one in four people, would you take it? And they, uniformly, the audience says, no. This is not one in four, this is one in 50. Mm. And yet these are the most successful drugs in the history of medicine. It just doesn't make sense and it just shows how distorted the evidence is. Well, let's pivot for a moment to go back to the diet. So how does eating a high fat diet affect one's appetite? Like, are you just like very satisfied or are you more and more ravenous? That's a great question because when I read the book, The New Atkins for the New You, it said, lose six kilograms in six weeks without hunger. And I said, well, that's rubbish. You can't lose food weight without hunger. And then I read it and it said, well, this is was Atkins's approach that he would only adopt a diet that took away his hunger. So anyway, I said, well, you know, I've, I've tried it and I've never been able to control my hunger on any other diet. Let's try it. And within a week, I'd lost, I think, 1.5 kilograms the first week. And I had no hunger and I couldn't believe it. 
because I was binge eating and my wife would always complain and she'd say to me, you know, I've cooked you this fantastic meal of really good food and you're eating this dreadful bread and peanut butter and jello on it and that's what you're eating. And that was my addiction. Now it's completely gone and now I eat one meal a day and I'm absolutely never hungry. I almost have to force myself to eat because I eat such good food and it's so nutrient dense that before I really feel hungry, I'd have to go for 24 hours without eating. That is amazing. And I get hugged in the street by people saying, thank you, you took away my food cravings. And now I've got a totally different relationship to food. I control the food, the food doesn't control me. And when you tell people this, they look at you and they start wondering and then they see, actually you're right, my food does control me. I have this huge breakfast of cereals and grains and orange juice and skim milk and sugar and bananas and three hours later I'm famished and I'm worrying where am I going to get my next meal from and then it's lunch and I've got to find the food. I go to work and well if there's no lunch, well there's no lunch, I'll go and find it somewhere if I need to. It's just so liberating. Sally Fallamrell, the head of the foundation, often says when you go on this deprivation diet, the state you're talking about where people are hungry and thinking they've got to stay away from certain things, there's this kind of tug of war that happens inside of them. So they go from the deprivation diet to where they just start eating everything and everything in sight, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> but it sounds like this approach has really helped you and thousands and thousands yeah. of others. I've probably spoken more to South Africans on diet than anyone in history, in fact, on a medical topic. So I probably spoke to about 30,000 South Africans in a period when we were promoting the real meal revolution. And the stories are always the same. Thank you for taking away my hunger. Thank you for giving me control of my diet. That's the most important event. Then they talk about the diabetes reversals and all those as well. But I've never heard someone say that their appetite had got worse on this diet. And they've not heard that. And I just want to address one more thing before we start to close up. Talk to us about the role of convenience foods, that something I think in your book you describe as Franken-foods. <laughs> what role do they play in what we choose to eat every day? Well, I mean, that is the real problem, and that's why we've become obese, is because we have bad breakfast, and then you've got to eat away from home. And then, of course, you'll get into this, what is the food? It's too terrible. It's all high carbohydrates, high sugar, highly refined, full of all these additives. And that's not food. You're eating to allay the addiction rather than to allay what you really need to eat. So I try to get people to understand that you must eat at home. And obviously, as you people preach, you must eat home prepared foods. And it's really important that you can go away from your home for 12 hours and not have to eat because you're not hungry. And if you are getting hungry, we'll take food with you. The real problem, and everyone knows this now, is that obesity is caused by this modern toxic food environment. And the more toxic it is, the fatter the people are. And, and we see that in South Africa, that the poorest people are targeted by the industries, the cola industries, and people selling highly refined foods. The diet of the poorest people is the worst, and they're the sickest. And my foundation, the Noakes Foundation, is trying to address that with a campaign we've called the Eat Better South Africa campaign, where we're trying to show people, even who are relatively poor, that they can still eat this diet at relatively two or three dollars a day is enough and you can actually eat quite well in South Africa on three dollars a day. Yeah, we're working on that over here too. The most needy and the poorest people are often very heavy because they live in food deserts and all they have available yeah. are these Franken foods, so to speak. And the industry targets them. And I mean, that's been exposed now recently where they're actively targeting the poorest of the poor to eat the worst foods, the most sugar intense foods that there are. I would love it, Tim, if you could get us links to some of the articles and resources that you've mentioned on the show, and we'll put them in the show notes because I want people to be able to find them for themselves. Some of these yeah. studies and your books that you've written, it just sounds fascinating. We need to wrap up now, though, so I want to ask you the question I often ask at the end of the interview. It's, if the listener could do one thing to improve their health, what would you recommend that they do? Cut sugar. That's the key. If you can get rid of the sweet taste, that will make you very healthy because you'll cut out all refined foods. The key is stop adding sugar to your diet and then make sure that you don't eat processed foods. But I think sugar is the first problem. And if you can cut that out, you're well on the way to eating a very healthy diet. Tim, thank you so much for all that you're doing to spread the word about real food bringing a really healthy life. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's a great honor to be on your show. My guest today was Professor Tim Noakes. 
To connect with Tim, go to the website for his foundation, thenoakesfoundation.org. That's N-O-A-K-E-S. This is the group that Tim founded to reverse the global trend of declining health and to redefine the dietary guidelines in South Africa. For an overview of our discussion today and links to resources we mentioned, just go to our website, westonaprice.org, and find the show notes for episode 121. Hey, and a big thank you to my friends at Podcast Village, both Rob's, the team of interns for the show, Cynthia Castro, Cohen Enriquez, Joy de los Santos, Elisa Canty, Lily Hampton, Amy Marvin. Hey, everybody, we do need one more intern, believe it or not, to help us identify sponsors for the show. If you'd like to help, just email me at podcast at westonaprice.org. And if you have a business and you want to actually advertise on the show, come on, we could use another sponsor. We have thousands of listeners, so it's a great way to get your name out there and find some new customers. Again, just reach out to me at podcast at westonaprice.org. Don't forget to stay tuned for next week's episode. It is a fascinating discussion with mental health author and Dr. Kelly Brogan. She discusses how depression is a symptom, not a disease. It is really an enlightening conversation because she talks about how much antidepressants are used the world over and how not only do they overpromise and underdeliver, but how their use may permanently disable the body's self-healing potential. By listening, you can learn how mental health concerns can be addressed in a different way, so you won't want to miss it. Hey guys, and don't forget to look me up. I'm at holistic underscore Hilda on Instagram, at holistic Hilda on Twitter. And I blog regularly on my website, holistichilda.com. I'm here to help you on your wellness or podcasting journey. So look me up and find out how I can support you at holistichilda.com. If you enjoyed today's episode, please share it with others. Post a link on Facebook or Twitter, or send a link to a friend in an email, or simply review Wise Traditions on iTunes. Sharing the podcast is one way to spread the important message of health through nutrition. Wise Traditions is brought to you by the Weston A. Price Foundation for Wise Traditions in Food Farming and the Healing Arts. The content of this podcast is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended as a substitute for medical advice.